is God, through the work of the Holy Spirit, still actively giving gifts today, like he gave gifts in the New Testament? That's going to be the subject of this video. If you like this, hit the like button. If you don't, hit the down button. Please subscribe and catch more of these by email. Hit the little bell so you get all the notifications. And uh, let's dive in. It is very important that our view on this is informed by the Bible. It's also very important that we also have some historical information to help guide our thoughts on this as well. Now, here's the popular view. This is the view that I grew up with. I grew up uh, hearing and understanding. This was my view for quite some time. And that is that the gifts of the Spirit stopped with the completion of the Bible. That once the Bible was written, once it was completed, that there was no more need for the work of the Spirit through prophecy and speaking in tongues and the gifts of knowledge and interpretation and all those things that we see like in 1 Corinthians 12. That once the Bible was written, because the gifts are seen, as attesting to the, the truthfulness of the word, that the, that the miracles confirmed the word, that there was no more need for miracles, that there was no more need for the gifting of the Spirit because the Bible was complete. The Bible was 1 Corinthians 13 perfect. Now, what went along with that view was to also bring another avenue to show that these gifts would, would end, which 1 Corinthians 13 does talk about them ending, that the, it was viewed that the apostles were seen as the ones who were to lay their hands on people and to impart the gifts, to give the gifts. That once the apostles died, that there was no one left then to be able to pass on the gifts to other people, and so the gifts were to die out. And so you kind of had this view, this systematic view, that because the gifts were to confirm the word, the truthfulness of the word, and because the apostles were seen in the book of Acts as the ones who passed on the gifts through the laying on of hands, that with the death of the apostles, that second generation had received the gifts, but were not then able to pass on the gifts. And because then the Bible was complete by the end of the first century, there was no more need for these miraculous things. And so we had a cessationist view that there were no more real miracles of God, or at least these gifts of the Spirit that were producing miraculous things. But the question is, does that view hold up biblically, and does that view hold up historically? And that's what we're going to examine in this video. So the first thing is this. The Bible does teach us that miracles do confirm the word. We see this in Acts 2.22 where Peter's preaching to the crowd and he says that Jesus was a man who his teaching was attested to you by miraculous signs, that these miracles were a sign that what he was saying was true. That's not just true of, uh, in the Bible of Jesus. That's also true in uh, Judaism, that there were Jewish rabbis who were said to be miracle workers and that people then believed those, the teachings of those rabbis based on the things that they were doing. And that's even true of, in, in pagan thought in the early years, in the first century. Vespasian was one who uh, kind of faked some miracles in order for people to believe that, that uh, he was supposed to have this kingdom and that these certain things were supposed to happen. Miracles were seen as attestation that, or to verify that certain people were saying truthful things or certain people were in the right position because it was seen as this divine favor. But my point is this, is that there was an understanding in the ancient world that miraculous things showed that that person had favor of divine powers, principalities and powers, in this case, God's favor. And so it is a valid point to say that miracles do actually confirm the truthfulness of things. If someone is lying, then God would not enable them to be doing miraculous things. But what this fails to recognize is that there actually are other needs for miracles other than just verifying the word. That view then just kind of boils miracles down to this one corner that says, once there's no more need to verify the word, there's no more need for the miracles. But there are still needs for miracles. There's a need for miracles in places where the Bible doesn't exist. There are still many, 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 many accounts, thousands of accounts of Jesus dreams in sub-Saharan Africa where, where there is no access to the Bible and Jesus comes and verifies himself to people through dreams. I believe that that truly does happen. Uh, so first thing is, do miracles verify the word? Yes, they do. But that's not their only purpose. So just to say because the word exists means we have no need for miracles, for the gifts, for the tongues, the prophecy, the knowledge, the interpretation, healings, resurrections, these sorts of things, doesn't mean that there's no more need for the miraculous, for the divine power to be at work in our lives, for the Holy Spirit to still be working. That does not necessitate a cessationist view, the ceasing, the stopping of the work of the Spirit. So here's the second piece, that the apostles were the ones through the laying on of hands to pass on the gifts of the Spirit. Now, 
the Bible does teach that there were times when apostles laid hands on people and passed on gifts. So the first thing is this. Yes, apostles do pass on gifts of the Spirit. In Acts chapter 8, verse 17, we see Peter and John do this. Uh, we see this in Acts 19, 6 with Paul doing this. Now, Paul is an apostle, but not one of the twelve. Paul does this, Acts 19, 6, with the Ephesians. And what's, what's interesting in Acts 8, going back to Peter and John, is that Philip is a part of this. And it seems as if Philip is waiting on Peter and John to come and do these things. That he's baptized them, but he has not given them the gifts of the Spirit. It's not till Peter and John arrive that they're able to do that. And, and ironically, I had someone uh, mention in a YouTube, another YouTube video comments a while back, uh, last week even, that, uh, that the fact that Philip couldn't give the gifts because he's waiting for Peter and John, showed, verified, that it was only the apostles who could do that. But oddly enough, Philip was an apostle. So Peter and John give the gifts of the laying on of hands. Paul gives the gift of the laying on of hands. That's Acts 8 and Acts 19. So yes, apostles do do that. The 12 do that. And also not one of the 12 apostles do that. You do realize there are people in the Bible named apostles, like Barnabas and Junia and others, who are not one of the 12. And so... The 12 apostles can, at least Peter and John can, but Philip can't. He is one of the 12. So sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. Maybe Peter and John always can, maybe Philip always can't. We really don't know, but it does seem in Acts 8 that Philip does not seem to have this ability, although he is one of the 12 apostles. So do the apostles, by the laying on of hands, give the gifts? Sometimes. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. There are also people other than the apostles who give the gifts, Look, uh, at least give the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts 9, 17, when um, Ananias lays hands on Saul and imparts healing on him of his blindness, but also imparts on him through the laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit. So there are people outside the apostles who seem to be able to lay hands on and at least give the Spirit, although it does not necessarily mean that he gave Saul the miraculous gifts of the Spirit. That's not really clearly is not really in the text, and so we really don't know that with Ananias. Uh, but it does show a non-apostle at least imparting the Spirit through the laying on of hands. I find that fascinating. Now, here are the, the two scriptures that show that the apostles are not necessary for the continuation of the gifts to last beyond the generation after the apostles. So again, the view is that if God gave the apostles the gifts of passing on the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, this would be again Acts 8 and 19, that then those who received the gifts did not have the ability to pass on the gifts, which would mean that the gifts would cease after that second generation. Here's the problem with that. Again, Ananias could be a problem, maybe not a problem. Philip certainly seems to be a problem that we had apostles who couldn't do it. But here's the thing. In Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, the Holy Spirit gives the gifts. Apart from the laying on of the apostles' hands, gives the gifts to the apostles and seemingly to more than the apostles because the women have to be involved per Joel 2. But even if you don't take Acts 2, and even if you think Acts 2 is only the 12, which doesn't really make sense from the text, if you hold that view, you still have Acts 10, where Cornelius and family receive the gift. Now, Peter is there, but Peter doesn't impart the gifts. Just like Acts 2, God gives the gifts without an intermediary. The traditional view requires an intermediary, apostles, to pass on the gifts to the second generation. And then with the death of the second generation, there is no more gifts because there's no apostles to give them. But Acts 2 and Acts 10 demonstrate that God can spontaneously give the gifts because Cornelius and company begin speaking in tongues and demonstrating the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Not just reception of the Holy Spirit, but the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Acts 10, to me, debunks the idea that God requires the original apostles for the giving of the gifts, which then means that God can give the gifts to whoever he wants, wherever he wants, whenever he wants. That, that it, even if the apostles die out, Acts 2 and 10 shows us that God can give the gifts to whoever he wants, whenever he wants. Even the fact that the apostles have the gifts, which I guess is an Acts 2 moment, is that God gave the gifts that without an intermediary. God does not require an intermediary to give the gifts. He could wait hundreds of years and give them to someone else, thousands of years and give them to someone else. God can do whatever he wants. So the next part of the view is that with the completion of the Bible, the gifts stopped because there was no more need for the gifts. Now we have to realize that the Bible itself was written in the first century. The New Testament was written in the first century. It was not 
uh, collected and canonized for a couple hundred more years. So depending on what your view of Bible is and how you uh, define that, you know, it could be a couple hundred years before that's even really a complete process. Now, I believe the traditional view would say once the last letter of Revelation is written and, the, and all the documents are there, there's no more need for the Holy Spirit to continue the gifts. That doesn't really make a lot of sense because the, the letters are still scattered. It's not compiled. Not everybody has access to it. And so there is still a need for the gifts of the Spirit, even when the last dot of Revelation is written for the prophecies and the tongues to continue on. We also have to remember that the people in the Bible had no concept of Bible other than the Old Testament, usually the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint. If you were to say like the scriptures to them, they would think Old Testament. So if we go back to 1 Corinthians 13 and you would ask yourself, what would the original readers in Corinth of 1 Corinthians 13 think about what Paul said and what he wrote there? They would definitely get that they have gifts and should use, use gifts, but they also should be people of love. They would also get from that that there will come a time when the gifts will cease, but that love will remain. Faith, open love will remain. And the greatest of these is love. That is clear in the text. We should all agree, yes, the gifts will end. But the, the question in 1 Corinthians 13 is when do the gifts end? And Paul gives the answer that it's when the complete comes, when the perfect comes, that there will be no more need for these gifts because everything will be in full, not just in part, that we can understand in full and not just understand in part. So now then the question becomes, what is the perfect? And would Paul's original readers read 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 and say, well, in 300 years, there will be a compilation of scriptures that will be canonized by council that we can then uh, bind up and hold in our hands as the agreed upon canonized uh, writings of the New Testament, inspired works of the New Testament, and, and, and you know the whole Bible even add the Old Testament, that this is what Paul meant when he wrote that. That when the teleos comes, when the complete, when the final, when the perfect, when it, that word can really mean when all things come to maturity, when they come to their end goal, that there's no more need for these gifts. That doesn't seem like a very natural reading of the text. So here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, when the NRSV says, when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. And again, we have to get back to authorial intent. What did Paul mean when he wrote that? Did Paul have a concept of the inspired books of the New Testament, that there'd be 27 of those and that they'd be compiled and canonized and bound up and sold on Christian bookshelves in uh, you know, 2020, if you could even get in a Christian bookstore today or order on Amazon? He had no conception of Bible as we think of Bible. Paul's Bible was the, the uh, Old Testament. And so that the idea of the Bible being the complete is just not plainly obvious in the text. And really, my honest opinion is this... Uh, in debate with other groups, this kind of becomes anti-Pentecostal rhetoric that we kind of win debates by finding ways around to make the text say certain things that are really not obvious in the text. That, that the complete would be the Bible is really not obvious in the text. To me, that's my opinion. You may have a different opinion. Think it's super obvious. I just can't imagine that in the first century, the first readers of the in Corinth could have ever come to that conclusion. And so what I believe the fullness is, the full maturity, the teleos, is the completeness is, is that when Christ comes back and he, and he claims his own and he raises the dead and we are fully, full-on new creation people, sometimes we think that a view is clearer in Scripture than it really is because we become familiar with that view. And so we say, well, it requires uh, the Bible to be the perfect in order for the gifts to cease. And, you know, when it's really not clear in the text, if we think that's clear, it may just be our familiarity with hearing that view so many times that we become so comfortable and familiar with that view that when we read the text, it just jumps out as if that's really clear. Put yourself in the mind of someone who doesn't have a Bible, someone who's in Corinth in the 50s AD, and they receive this letter and they read it as it is. What would you think the complete would be? What would Paul's authorial intent be with the complete? Could Paul have had some conception of 27 books uh, all being finished and put together for the ending of gifts? Now, here, here's, uh, and, and the analogy I use with that is, is a castle analogy. In the towers and castles, um, they actually make the steps spiral up in a way that the person on top's right hand is free. 
so that the person coming up the steps who's the attacker is right hand is up against the wall and the person looking down the steps the defender's right hand is out over the open space right so that they have a more free hand the person attacking coming from the bottom is having a more difficult time fighting because their arms up against the wall the person who's defending from the top has an advantage and they would also make the steps different heights they were not all uniform steps so that if you were familiar with that castle and you were in it every day going up and down, up and down, and you knew it, you would know when to go up higher and which step to put lower. But if you were not familiar with that, you'd have to watch each step as you went up because it's not all even and that puts you at a disadvantage when you're attacking and it puts the defender at the advantage, the home court advantage. Familiarity sometimes doesn't allow us to see or hear the scriptures well. Because we've become familiar with a certain way of viewing the text, it's hard for us to see it any other way. And so if for you, when you read perfect or complete and all you can think of is Bible, again, I would challenge you to put yourself back in the mindset of a Corinthian in, in the 50s AD, reading this for the first time, hearing this for the first time, what do you think they would have come away with? That 300 years from now, there will be 27 books who will be agreed upon by counsel, that they are inspired the word of God, that will be bound up and put out for consumption. I, I don't, that's just not at all clear in the text to me. Now, here's the last piece of this is history. Now, this is something that was never shared. I would hear, okay, the gifts ended and there was no more miracles after the you know first century or that second generation died and those things were done. The Holy Spirit checked out. The Holy Spirit went into retirements. God's kind of twiddling his thumbs and watching from above. You got to know that the historical record is that miracles, the miraculous gifts of the Spirit, have continued ever since the first century. And you could say, well, people were mistaken. People were uninformed. People really didn't know, or people made these things up. Uh, people were making it up because it would verify the message. Okay, that probably happened. Um, but like N.T. Wright says, you don't throw away your $100 bills just because there's a few fakes out there. There are fake workings of the Spirit today. Uh, but that does not necess necessitate that there are no workings of the Spirit today just because there's something fake. And our, sometimes our hesitancy to accept the real is because we're afraid of being duped by the fake. And, you know, we don't want to go there. I understand that. And so we've become heavily rooted in the Word and not very heavily rooted in the Holy Spirit because we don't think the Spirit's doing an awful lot. So I want to mention a few names of some people who mentioned miracles happening in their day. Uh, St. Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, he's one. And what's so fascinating about his account of the, of the miracles is that he actually was a skeptic. He actually didn't believe that they happened until he says that one day, and this is, this is in City of God, I believe, he mentions that he actually saw this with his own eyes and he became a believer in the miraculous working of the Spirit. That's in City of God 22.8, if you want to look that up. And not only that, but he says we then began, or they began recording these things, and they had over 70 documents of miracles several hundred years after uh, the first century. They were exorcisms that happened in the first several hundred years of the, of the church. And often those exorcisms, uh, Craig Keener in his book on miracles, he says that it was the exorcisms in the history of the early church that actually was a big part of church growth. Again, verifying the word, miracles verifying the word, casting out demons, miraculous power, uh, and the growth of Christianity in the first 300 years is a very interesting thing. Origen, Athanasius, Cyprian, Tertullian, Irenaeus, Basil, Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory of Nyssa, John Chrysostom, Basil, Ambrose, on and on it goes, the list of church fathers who attest to the miracles, the miraculous working of the power of God through the work of the Holy Spirit. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, tracks in the Middle Ages. And now, once you get to the Protestant Reformation, there becomes then that starts to be that pushback. We have to know our influences here, that Western Enlightenment scientific culture inoculates us from the divine, from the work of the Spirit, as does uh, Protestantism. That once Protestant Reformation took place and the uh, pushback against the relics and the miraculous power of the relics came a real insulation uh, of us from the work of the Holy Spirit. That's a really, really important thing to realize that our view can be very culturally conditioned. Our view is probably almost always culturally conditioned. That uh, again, science, we can explain everything through logic and reasoning and science also influences cessationism, as does, again, the Western uh, Protestant skepticism on the, the, the relics and the work of the Spirit. Again, that's pushback against the fake that insulates us from the true and the real. So let's sum this up. What the Bible does not actually teach, the Bible never actually says 
that only apostles can lay on hands and impart gifts. It never teaches that. The Bible never teaches that when the apostles die, it's done. The Bible never teaches that the second generation can't do it. It never shows them doing it, but it never says that they can't. And the absence of an, of an example doesn't mean it's impossible. Sometimes we base our view on lack of example when that really doesn't tell us much of anything. The Bible never actually says it's the Bible that's the perfect. That's an inference based on a lot of other points of reference that have to come together to make that happen. And again, that's our interpretation. That's poor interpretation. So two last things. Uh, here's what I think. God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, with whoever he wants. And this is the thought that opened me up to the continuing work of the Holy Spirit. It's in Mark chapter 3, verse 29, when Jesus talks about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And he, here's what happened. Jesus healed a man and forgave his sins. The crowd, some believed and some were skeptical. Uh, Jesus goes on to cast out a demon. And what's very clear is that these things actually happened. The lame man stood up and walked. Uh, the uh, man with the demon, demon was cast out. But to forgive sins, there's no visible sign of that. You can't really tell. There's not like a button on our head that pops up when our sins forgiven or something. And so the people accuse Jesus of blasphemy. So when he casts out the demon in Mark 3, it hits the Pharisees in the crowd and the, the skeptics. And they say, that really happened. But how? Where did the power come from? And the only thing they could reason was because they thought he was a blasphemer, because he also did some work on the Sabbath, uh, or commanding work by telling the man to take up his mat and walk him. My memory is correct there in Mark 2 and 3. Uh, they thought he was a Sabbath breaker and they thought he's a blasphemer. And so God can't do miracles through a person like that. So who, uh, who else does a demon listen to? If someone commands, who else will a demon obey? The prince of demons. So they reason that Jesus must be doing these miracles by the prince of demons. And then Jesus warns them about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And what that means is that when God works, if we see it and, de and deny it, we put ourselves in a very dangerous position, denying the work and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So here's what I decided. I decided this. Yes, there are fakes, there are phonies out there, but I'm going to never put myself in a position of denying the authentic work of the Holy Spirit. I will leave that between God and others. So if people are speaking in tongues, if people are interpreting, if people say they're prophesying, I will leave that between them and God. I will not put myself in the awkward and dangerous position of being a Holy Spirit working denier because I believe it puts us in a very dangerous and precarious spiritual position. Now, I do believe that there's a difference between actually seeing it and denying it and denying it in theory. When we're not around it and not seeing it and just say, well, I just don't really believe that happens. I think that there is a distinction and a difference between those two situations, but I don't want to put myself in a position of denying what God may really be doing all around me, but to open myself up to the reality that God continues to work. He works in so many ways. He works daily. He answers prayers. God's still doing miracles. And so let's be open, my view, maybe you share it, maybe you don't, to the continuing work of the Holy Spirit to do miraculous things. The world is in desperate need of this. I'm in desperate need of this. We all are in desperate need of this. And so let's pray for miracles. Let's pray for God to continue to work and not be afraid of what might happen if God did something outside our comfort zone, because I guarantee you, He's already doing it. And what's so interesting about this conversation is that in non-Western culture, where we, we believe that science can explain everything, which is not, you know, science can explain a lot, but we also have faith, that in non-Western cultures, these things are happening like crazy. That the fastest growing groups in the world of Christianity are, are Pentecostal movements, are movements where these things are taking place with regularity. And again, maybe that attests to the word. People believe it, they see it, they believe it, and they get on board. But, you know, we need, I believe, to be open to these things um, and, and just see what God does with it and be praying for a movement of God. We should be praying that God would move in these ways and just wait and see what God does because he's already doing way more than we know. And if we knew all he was doing it, I guarantee you, you wouldn't be comfortable with it. And so let's begin warming up to all that God is doing. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Hit the like button. Let me hear from you in the comments and we will catch you next time.